Humeral shaft fractures. This is from the OTA Core Curriculum Resident Lecture Series, Version 5. Slides are by Dr. Christopher Sugalski and Amsaka Brahman narrating. This is our fourth and final video in this slide deck. Uh, we already covered quite a bit, and uh, we're going to finish up now with uh, talking about extra-articular distal third humeral shaft fractures and uh, also a little bit about radial nerve palsy and complications. So... Uh, it's important to kind of think about the distal third humeral shaft fractures. It's a pretty common fracture pattern. Uh, and uh, here's a paper looking at um, operative versus non-operative treatment. Uh, two different centers. Uh, this is going back uh, a little bit, uh, this paper, but uh, they really did look specifically at this fracture pattern and um, whether or not you really have to operate on these or can treat them non-surgically. And... Uh, they found that uh, with open reduction in internal fixation, uh, they did get 15% radial nerve palsy uh, when they did uh, brace, fix, uh, brace treatment. Um, they uh, had to convert to ORF sometimes, uh, but malunion rates were fairly low, and uh, uh, you would get some issues with skin breakdown, a little bit of stiffness. Um, but uh, their conclusions were that uh, you know, operative management certainly uh, can provide more predictable alignment and quicker return to function, but there is a non-negligible risk of iatrogenic nerve palsy uh, and potential infections. And bracing is not without its risks, but um, function and range of motion are usually excellent. So you got to think about what your goals are and uh, maybe how any of those potential risks could be worse for your particular patient when considering how to manage these. So uh, in the distal humerus, uh, again, intraarticular fractures is a different ball game, but we're talking here about extraarticular shaft fractures that get down to the distal humerus. So you need two plates. So here's a cadaveric biomechanical study uh, in which they showed that um, you know, a single pre-contoured posterior lateral locked plate, at least in their model, was biomechanically similar to doing orthogonal dual plates. Um, so keep that in mind with certain fracture patterns. And of course, with experience, you'll get a better sense of when you really need to add a second plate. But um, I think with uh, fractures where you can get good bone contact and compression uh, in a distal third fracture, a lot of times a single plate can be perfectly fine. Uh, and that could lead to, you know, De decreased exposure, especially uh, uh, having to dissect out the ulnar nerve and having a plate right there. So um, paradigm shift in surgical reconstruction of extra articular distal humeral fracture, single column plating. So looking at that concept, 105 patients in two trauma centers uh, treated with the uh, tricep split approach, single column, posterior lateral. Um, I'm sorry, two techniques. One was dual complaining with a tricep split, and the other was this sort of pre-contoured hockey stick type plate done through a paratricipital approach. So two techniques done at the two centers. The results were relatively similar uh, in terms of union and alignment. Uh, perhaps there were fewer complications with the single column plating. Um, so Again, some suggestion that when you can, uh, avoiding having to do the second plate might potentially be better. Um, here's a review article in 2018 on best care paradigm to optimize functionality after extraarticular distal humeral fractures in the young patient. You may want to check this out. Um, and um, again, in Sarmiento's series, we didn't review this particular paper, but he had 85 patients with distal third humeral fracture. Uh, quite a high uh, loss to follow-up, which is what we see in most of these studies, uh, but 96% union rate, um, certainly quite a few varus malunions and uh, some decreased shoulder motion. Uh, in other studies, we've seen non-union rates 10 to 15% uh, and excellent outcomes in 50%. Um, so the brace can have issues. You can have skin breakdown, compliance issues, um, and then sometimes after failed brace treatment, uh, if you then have to go in, the surgery can be a little bit more difficult. Uh, real nerve palsy rates are still non-negligible. And now you've been treated non-surgically, you had all this time off, uh, and you've gotten stiff, and now you're going to go in and, and fix them. So um, you know, that may not be the sort of best um, 
course of action for the patient once after the fact you realize you've gone down that road. So um, with surgical treatment, they suggest perhaps there's less stiffness because you know, you're able to move them right away, decreased malunion rates, ret faster return to activities of daily living. Uh, you have to consider the patient characteristics, all these things as listed here. Um, and you have to consider uh, radial nerve injury. You know, there can be entrapment. Do you want to you know, go in and dig that out uh, in a sort of scarred in tissue bed or would you rather do it when it's relatively fresh? Uh, and can be more mobilized. Uh, and uh, you know, if you do a non-union surgery after humeral, because yeah, you could say, well, we're treating non-surgically. If it really doesn't heal, then we can go in. Well, you have to consider all these issues. And uh, iatric radial nerve palsy is, uh, you know, four to nineteen percent. So tricep split. We talked about approaches in the first video. Tricep splits falling a little bit out of favor. Paratricipital approach is a little bit of a longer exposure, but it gives you more extensile uh, exposure. Um, you are not splitting the muscle, you're mobilizing it, so perhaps there's less muscle trauma and scarring and improved motion. Um, and, you know, acceptable incidences of radial nerve palsy. Um, and this particular paper also talked about single versus double pleating in the distal uh, fractures and uh, reiterating that single pleating can avoid issues with the ulnar nerve and shorten your surgical time, etc. So a little bit about radial nerve palsy. So again, the radial nerve palsy is going to lead to numbness in that area of distribution colored here and a wrist drop, right? And this is something that unfortunately happens with a lot of humeral shaft fractures due to the intimacy of the radial nerve. Uh, and the distal third fractures tend to be associated with these quite a bit as well, but these can happen uh, and mid-shaft fractures uh, just as um, easily, but the so-called Holstein-Lewis fracture is this sort of distal third fracture and is associated with the radial nerve palsy. Um, so uh, in this paper, 2005, uh, systematic review, 11.8% radial nerve palsy uh, with increased uh, frequency in the mid to distal fra uh, fractures. Uh, and most, but not all, will recover. Um, so 70% is a good number, but it's not a great number um, that will recover. So that's what you can kind of tell a patient. Um, now, iatrogenic nerve palsy can occur uh, with both anterior and posterior approaches as well. And this is a retrospect retrospective study uh, looking at uh, preoperative nerve palsy and iatrogenic radial nerve palsy. And most of those recur uh, res resolve. Uh, and did not require surgery, but it's still a little bit um, uh, anxiety-provoking uh, for the surgeon and the patient uh, when that occurs. And if you look at uh, radial nerve palsy by location, you can see uh, it occurs all over, uh, but certainly a little bit more in the middle and distal third fractures. So uh, another systematic review uh, by Dr. Ilias and JAAOS in 2020, uh, again, showing about 70 plus percent, percent spontaneous recovery. Um, and uh, they said that um, exploration, early exploration is associated with better recovery of nerve function, uh, but it's not clear if there was causation. Non-union. So um, non-union, uh, we've talked about a little bit here and there. Um, the radiographic union score for humeral shaft fractures is one way that people have looked at this to predict non-union. We talked also about a clinical exam you could check at six weeks to check for motion at the fracture site to predict potential non-union. But they found with this scoring system, fractures with the uh, rush U uh, less than eight at six weeks were 12 times more likely to develop a non-union. Of course, this is looking at you know your radiographs and sort of scoring um, the amount of callus. So here's an example uh, from um, the uh, Rockwood and Green online. Um, if you're at go to ota.org and you have all OTA uh, online access, you can get this. Here's a non-union and a polytrauma patient had originally been treated with intramedullary nailing. Well, now you got to go in, take the nail out, identify the radial nerve, and then uh, go ahead and do a plate and screw fixation. 
and this one does go on to eventually heal. Here's a case, transverse fracture of the humeral shaft treated with uh, functional bracing, um, and uh, then goes on to uh, have open reduction internal fixation, unfortunately gets painful, there's a non-union, um, and unfortunately also infected. So the plate has to be removed, non-union site is debrided. So this is a fairly complex case where you can see a ring external fixator being used to eradicate infection and eventually fracture is healed. So a little bit more of a complex case. Um, so in summary, most uncomplicated humeral shaft fractures will do well with non-op management in a functional brace. Uh, but recent studies report non-union uh, non -union rates 10 to 25%, which is, uh, uh, which is different than uh, Sarmiento's original results, which had 90-plus uh, you know, 90 90 plus percent union. Um, anterolateral approach uh, is great to get you to proximal and middle third fractures. Posterior approaches are great for mid to distal third fractures. Um, plates and nails offer similar outcomes, except you just have more shoulder issues with anterograde nailing. Uh, MEPO plating has had good results, and it's evolving as an attractive alternative treatment. Uh, if you're treating distal third fractures, a lot of them can be treated with a single column pre-contoured plate. Um, radial nerve palsy, unfortunately, is going to occur in 12% of these. Uh, most will spontaneously recover, but not all. Uh, and... Unfortunately, these can sometimes happen from iatrogenic uh, causes uh, with operative intervention. So if you're choosing operative uh, intervention, you really have to make sure you and your patient are, all, are aware that they could go to sleep with a radial nerve palsy and then wake up with one, although most of those will recover. A lot of references, so I'll give you a second here. If you need to pause, take a look and uh, look check out any of the papers and the references here for this slide deck. Thank you.